Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Welcome back to the High Rise, a laid back, data back conversation on all things cannabis, where we talk about US MSOs, Canadian LPs, products and market analysis through the lens of data. As always, I am joined by Emily Paxia of Poseidon. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the High Rise. And today we've got a very special guest with Matt McGinley of Needham. Welcome, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here for this uh, laid back data driven discussion. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. And this uh, week is going to be I pretty exciting. Say, yeah. I'm really excited to have Matt on for this week in particular. Um, for those who don't know, Matt's updates are the updates I read every time they come out. So not trying to make him feel <laughs> too special, but very excited <laughs> to have him on, especially during this uh, very active week. But go ahead, Cy. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the updates are fantastic, and I got to give you uh, serious credit for the titles of the reports yes. that you pull together. So can't can't be easy, but they're they're super clever. So big earnings week this week, which is uh, you know really what what we're here to talk about. Lots to discuss, and obviously having an expert like Matt here will really kind of help help with the conversation. But I think um, let's let's start before we get into the individual companies. Let's start by just talking about kind of some of the broader trends. I know some of the familiar patterns started showing up on some of these calls. So before we get into each company, let's let's talk about that. Matt, what what did you kind of see as far as just kind of broader trends on on all the earnings calls? I guess to to frame the big picture in the third quarter, so that the top line growth for the industry decelerated to something that was probably close to flat quarter over quarter into the third quarter. You know, the industry growth was probably up like probably 6% in the first quarter and, and probably around 12% in the second quarter. That's not uncommon when you're measuring things sequentially to, to have fits and starts in, in growth rates. So sequential growth isn't necessarily like the end of the world, but in, and to be fair, like year over year growth is up probably around 17, 18%. So that's still pretty good. But, and again, I'll, I'll say like there was a sequential slowdown in the fourth quarter of 2020 and things rebounded nicely and and all that, but you know, things did slow down in the quarter. The overall industry is still probably going to be up around 25% uh, year over year in 2021, which is really outstanding for industry growth. But there are, there are likely a host of factors that would pressure the growth rate in the third quarter. The big factors, I think, are macro related. You know, we haven't fully recovered the job losses from the COVID recession, but people are going back to work and returning to school and, you know, going back to like a normal pre COVID type routines and activities. So that likely impacted the category. Inflation is likely reducing disposable income, so spending growth is under pressure. That's compounded by you know, the, the transfer payments and economic stimulus payments that are, that are now ending. We also had more competition in markets like Pennsylvania and Florida on price. And then we you know, deal with these you know, constant, uh, seemingly constant issues with you know, illicit supply and, and markets that, that tend to be a, a bigger impact on the, on the West Coast. But that's an ongoing issue, but that was an issue for sure in the quarter. But the setup for if you're like a really high growth company and your top line, if the industry growth overall slows down, that becomes a big issue for earnings. So the, the average of these bigger MSOs this year will have about a double in revenue. I mean, they're growing their, their revenue by over 100% uh, from 2020 to 2021. And into in next year, we think that that'll probably be around between 50 and 60% growth. Um, now, some of that growth comes from things like M&A, but a lot of that is development of assets on the production and the dispensary side. And that growth requires investment in new people and systems and infrastructure to support that growth. So think about like people-wise, you need like more brand managers and marketing managers and supply chain people and plant managers and retail staff. And, you know, like in some states, you have to have a pharmacist before you can open a dispensary and so on. And so you're investing ahead of all these things. So when a company is like gearing for 60% growth in 2022, and then they get hit with a quarter where the industry growth is flat, I mean, that's going to have a margin impact because the costs and the revenues are not going to be aligned. Um, now, the impact for each company is going to be different. And a lot of these guys are still, you know, a lot of these companies, I should say, are still like moving their margins upward. So it's not the same impact on every company, but no company is, is immune from those effects. And, and the other thing to, to note here, and that's not really specific to cannabis, but I'll loop cannabis into it, we are now in a fairly inflationary environment in the U.S. at inflation rates that we haven't seen in about 30 years. There are supply chain and production issues occurring across the globe right now. There's, there's a lot that goes into that that probably don't need to discuss in this podcast, but you know, cannabis isn't very reliant upon an Asian supply chain, but obviously cannabis is produced in each state and legally can't cross a state line, but global production 
uh, ramped down everywhere in 2020 into the COVID recession. And now with everything trying to ramp back up, there are significant bottlenecks that are occurring in manufacturing and shipping, and that's driving costs up and it's driving up the prices of most things for the average person in, in North America. And now legal cannabis is generally a deflationary category. And so you probably have like pretty good data on that, but most markets when they open up have significant supply demand imbalances when they open, but as things sort of normalize or the, the growth rates kind of normalize, you tend to see prices come down. Uh, so when the price of cannabis is deflationary and everything else is inflationary, like labor and packaging and electricity and construction costs, that's not a good combo because your your per unit costs uh, are, are going down, or, 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 the, or the, your, your, your revenue per unit, I should say, is going down, but your per, per unit costs are going up. And so that, that pinches your margin. And so that that's kind of the backdrop we're looking at right now. That 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 all sounds kind of dreary on the outlook, and I would say broadly those are probably going to be shorter term issues. But um, I wouldn't say the outlook for the industry is necessarily negative. Um, this is a probably a twenty four twenty five billion dollar category this year. That's probably going to like forty three to forty five billion by twenty twenty five. So it's still like seventy five percent growth, um, and a lot of that's driven by state level reforms that. Um, drive the industry development. So that not not really driven by anything that would occur at the at the federal level. But the other thing to think about too is that these stocks have had just awful equity performance this year, uh, but they're they're dirt cheap. So these these stocks trade at like under time under under ten times twenty twenty two EV to EBITDA, and the top line growth uh, outlook for these companies is phenomenal. So you have this oddball combination of very high growth companies that trade at very low multiples, that is just a really, really unusual event. Most of these companies are, are um, how should I put this, like th that's such an odd, oddball thing to see. It's like, that's like a four or five standard deviation event outside of, of the mean of what you would see for a normal industry. It's just a, it, it's an outlier or a uh, spurious data point that uh, this industry trades at it, at, you know, like I said, having such high growth rates and such low multiples. So wouldn't say there's anything really broadly wrong with the industry, but there are macro issues and there are things going on right now that are pressuring the uh, pressuring the companies. Yeah, yeah, all, all good points. Certainly the uh, the multiples on 2022 EBITDA is something that is, is quite fascinating. We talk about it from time to time on the show and, you know, I feel like uh, it seems to be lack of institutional investment and it's just getting, you know, harder with news like JP Morgan uh, just a, a week or so ago. But yeah, with this type of, I mean, it's still growth. I think everyone that reported still saw growth, maybe, you know, some a little slightly than they had predicted, you know, a small amount of growth, but uh, yeah, still certainly growth there. And so with that, let's let's start talking about the companies. Let's start with Cureleaf. They were the first to report their numbers that they put out on the board, $317 million in Q3 revenue, so up 2% quarter over quarter, so relatively flat, but but some growth. In your in your coverage, you mentioned a hot mess of a quarter, and so I was curious around, uh, like that could mean a lot of things. Obviously, all these factors that you're talking about was it just a mix of things in there? They they, they do so much, right? With their scale, their footprint, they're in so many markets. Uh, that they're, they're doing a lot of different things. They had some challenges in Q3 with some like one-time events, I believe. How would you, when you think about the hot mess uh, there, what stands out the most? Yeah, so look, they, they have the same macro issues at play, but they have, I mean, Cureleaf has a, the widest footprint and they operate in the most markets. So when, there's nowhere to hide when things slow down for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're right, the revenue only grew 2% uh, sequentially, which is a very low growth rate for any of these companies. Wholesale grew 3%, retail grew 1%. They only added a few dispensaries, but they, were, they seem to have more, a few company specific issues that revolved around the Northeast. They are bigger in New York than average, and New York is not that big of a market at this point, but patient growth slowed in New York. There was not flower until October, and Cureleaf is a bigger player, and so softness there hurts them probably more than other MSOs on a dollar basis. In New Jersey, there's, I think, 20, 20 or so dispensaries that are now medical dispensaries that are operational in the state. There, That's added to significantly. That's not a whole lot of dispensaries, but they, you know, Cureleaf had an extremely high volume dispensary in New Jersey that now has a ton of competition. Now that's a short term thing because the eye on the prize in New Jersey is really adult use, and so is at the end of the world if the dispensary volume declines on that over the short term. But that that was a headwind. Um, their Massachusetts sales likely suffered because they had uh, they lost a wholesale sales team in the state, so they had to rehire uh, that team. And then 
in Maine, they had a fire in, in one of their uh, cultivate, or maybe not one of their, but the cultivation facility, and uh, that, that burned down. And so they had uh, they had uh, no wholesale product to sell, and that required them to to buy product for the dispenser uh, dispensaries, which would have had a, a negative margin impact. But overall, the, I mean, the top line was slow, as as was for the industry. Um, not a heroic uh, growth rate, but their gross margin should have been up by probably a few hundred basis points in the quarter because they added about 80% of their production capacity this year was added in the first half. So that leverage that they would have gotten from those assets coming online should have been quite large, but gross margins weren't up a couple hundred basis points. They were down a couple hundred basis points. Now they promoted pretty intensively in the quarter. Probably about a point of that was driven by promotion. And then you know the, the, the sell through a product from new production facilities was lower with the top line. And so their average unit costs were probably you know higher in the quarter. And then they had, you know, from a, from a G&A standpoint, when you strip out some of the noisy stuff with one-time items, their dollar spend increased by about 11%. So they went from 79 million in G&A to around 88 million, but their top line only grew 2%. So their, that hit their margin rate by about 250 basis points. So from an EBITDA standpoint, uh, we thought that they would probably grow around $10 million sequentially, but with a lower top line growth rate, and these margin headwinds, the EBIT dollars, EBITDA dollars actually dropped by $13 million sequentially. And instead of EBITDA rate being up a couple hundred basis points, they actually dropped from 27% in the second quarter down to 22 and a half in the third quarter. So, you know, I'm not sure if the perfect storm is the right analogy, but, you know, everything kind of came together and, uh, you know, into this uh, kind of one big hot mess of a quarter and wasn't, wasn't particularly good. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's funny. We've talked about it on the previous episodes during earnings. The MSOs are starting to kind of emerge to have their own approaches to the market. And Cureleaf is certainly, it's like, go big or go home, baby. And they have, it almost reminds me a little bit of how Canopy Growth Corp a, approached their f- initial runs out of the gate. They were able to, on a lot of, you know, big, bold conversations, raise a lot of money and you know, for a long time, Cureleaf stock was outperforming, for example, GTIs. And we were, as you know, we were early in GTI and invested. They had a very different strategy around how they were approaching the markets. And, and I, their stock performance, frankly, lagged for a, a while on that. And I think, you know, the Cureleaf team used that outperforming of their stock and then the ability to raise uh, cash on that to go after some really big moves. And I see a pattern to the quarters where right before the quarter comes out, which they tend to miss on on some of their metrics pretty frequently. But before the quarter tends to get announced, they announce a really large acquisition. So the last time it was EMAC, I think. And then this time we're talking about the bigger move on Trike. Trike, did I say that right? So there's like that and then there's the quarter. I think the market is getting a little bit more focused on some of these fundamentals such as EBITDA and ultimately free cash flow and and the cash on cash performance of the business and uh, and also you know the loading of the balance sheet for the ability to make acquisitions more tactfully going forward so I think it'll just be interesting to watch what happens next but it, it's definitely a pattern we've been tracking and and seeing how these companies are all kind of diverging on their strategy and the way that they're going about the market I think although on the positive side I would say that I think Many of these issues will dissipate in the fourth quarter and into 2022. Um, they'll probably get gross margins that are back up close to 50% by the fourth quarter, and their EBITDA rate probably improves from that 22 to probably 25 or 26 in the fourth quarter. They also have like $400 million in cash. Yep. I should say they will likely have around $400 million of cash at year end. They can refi this $300 million debt that they have. There'll be a prepayment penalty on that, but they could potentially use that to boost their cash balances should they, should they want to. Um, but if they spent a similar amount of capex next year as they did this year, they'll likely be free cash flow positive. And that, in my view, is sort of like the gold standard for these companies: is being free cash flow positive, is being self funding, and you know, they they might not need to raise additional capital, but they could spend more on capex, and they could continue to buy things like trike and and you know expand their footprint in, in states like Nevada and Arizona. They have a very broad footprint, but there still are opportunities for bolt on promotion. And then, and then probably the promotion that was, you know, pretty intense in the third quarter, you know, they were, you know, I mean, I guess the concern was that they were price irrational. They can't, how can they do these things? And, you know, how can they <laughs> be promoting so intensively? But I mean, if they're, and, and that was probably most acute in Florida, but they say they're, they're running north of a 30% EBITDA margin in Florida and they, you know, they doubled their volume share from seven and a half percent at the beginning of the year to around 15% right now. So it seems like they're promoting a little bit less intensively in the fourth quarter, but 
you know, that promotion level could be sustainable. And, you know, if, if it's only a 30 basis point drag or so on their, on their margin rates, then they could sustain that and continue to probably build share in a state like that. Now, on the negative side, I would say that the, you know, Cureleaf is the biggest, but they're not the best in terms of margin or operating efficiency. You know, there's nothing magical about, you know, 50% as a gross margin and 30% as an EBITDA rate. But, you know, I view 50% as a gross margin as sort of the target that these companies should be at at this point in their life cycle. Yeah. Um, and 30% on an EBITDA rate is kind of where these companies need to be. And, you know, they're they're below that. They were at four, you know, forty seven percent gross margin in this in this quarter, and they were at twenty two and a half on on EBITDA. So there's some improvement that needs to you know go on there. And uh, I guess the other, the other thing I would note is that uh, you know the growth into next year is is good. I mean they'll probably do a billion two to a billion two two five in twenty twenty one, but they'll probably do a billion six in revenue and. Uh, you know, their EBITDA will have, you know, significant growth. I think the consensus numbers are probably still, or probably a little bit high for, for what they'll do in, in 22, but, you know, they, they'll likely have a very strong year into next year. And yeah, I think next year will, will, will ultimately be a good year for, for most uh, companies in this space, but the, the trajectory after earnings here, and this is true for all these companies, but for Kirillif especially, it seems a little bit low into the, the I should say the exit rate into from tw- from twenty one and into into twenty two seems a little bit low and it's not not a, not a good not a particularly good setup uh, in terms of uh, uh, looking at those uh, those estimates for next year and, and companies being able to hit them. I think you're right. I'm I'm glad you mentioned the restructuring of their debt because I do think that'll be very helpful for them on the go forward. Even if there yeah. is a prepayment penalty, I think that'll be yeah. good to. Clean In a it minimum, up. it'll it'll save them some interest. Exactly. Maybe get it. Yeah. It's, it's amazing just to your point about the equity markets and how difficult they've been. But on the flip side, the abundance of, of uh, interest on the debt side and the institutional interest on that side, too. So it's interesting. Yeah. One of the things I want to cover on Cura Leaf too, and, and maybe most of these companies is kind of their mix, retail versus wholesale. And, you know, one, one thing that's interesting to me about Cura Leaf is Boris Johnson, their chairman, has been very explicit about in interviews, like we're going to be a CPG company, we're going to be the Frito-Lay of cannabis. And I think they came in wholesale is 29% wholesale, 71% retail. Retail revenue increased 1% quarter over quarter. But at the same time, you know, Emily, you called out their, their trike investment. What do you think their their path, is it going to get to something like 50-50? Do you think a 30-70 split is where they'll always be? Or will it just kind of depend on the dynamics of the market and like what markets they're in? Like you mentioned promotion, you mentioned Florida, and Florida is strictly vertically integrated. You know, they are producing some products, uh, but it's almost private label in, in a market like that versus, you know, having a brand like Select in California. You know, what do you think, Matt uh, or Emily, about like just the kind of their mix there? Do you think 70-30 is pretty standard? Uh, it seemed kind of low to me, given the way they talk about you know CPG as being so important. Well, I think one thing you have to remember is that it's uh, it I mean, nothing is easy in, in the cannabis space, but it's easier <laughs> to put up a dispensary than it is to put up a, a cultivation facility. And so, you know, generally with many of these companies, the dispensary base is is faster and easier to to, to put up. Um, but I mean, Cureleaf still has another you know twenty or thirty dispensaries they'll probably do into into you know twenty uh, you know twenty two. But as those cultivation facilities come online, and they have you know they have big projects coming online in New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and Florida, they'll have a bigger grow in Pennsylvania. That'll feed into the feed into the the, the wholesale channel, um, so that will likely grow. I mean, I don't know what the magic number. I mean, it, it was, I don't think it's a magic number to say like oh they need to be at fifty fifty or they need to be at thirty seventy or whatever. But I would think that over time, for many of these companies, that wholesale mix would likely would likely trend higher because at a certain point you're just you're going to hit the statutory caps in a lot of these states and you and you you're just going to have less you know kind of step up revenue growth driven driven by the uh, the the retail additions and more of that will come from the wholesale business or CPG business but that that'll that'll go up over time I don't, I don't know what the right number would be over the long term for Cureleaf but it'll be you know higher than it higher than it is uh, today you know right right yeah so much is just driven by the structure of these different markets, and you know, once they hit yeah. that retailer cap, then the growth will come from from the brands from the CPG wholesale side. Uh, speaking of this quarter, you know they introduced a few things. I think in the select side, the select squeeze THC infused beverage enhancer, which is like the drops that you put in to a drink. They introduced it in uh, Michigan, New Jersey, and New York at the same time. I think with previous select products, they they've actually hit like 
15, 16 markets at the same time, which is like it's impressive. really impressive. It's really yeah, hard, it's hard to, do. to do. Yeah. Yeah. A brand, and particularly when you control the output, you know, we've seen brands that do more of a licensing structure, you know, a good, a good one that's, you know, well-known is, is Wana, you know, and they made headlines recently with, um, with Canopy, but mu- much of their state footprint is just licensed out to other, other providers. And so you see a situation where Wana products in Colorado are very different than products that they might have in Oregon or in California. So it is, it is a pretty um, interesting c- capability, I think, as, as this industry gets more normalized and, you know, to build a, a mainstream brand. Uh, I thought, that, you know, the select squeeze, kind of given some of the data we see, like the beverage drops that aren't a big portion of a of already small percentage of sales that go to beverage in general. Yeah. And and I, you know, I'm sure some of that has to do with there's just not a lot of people producing beverages at it to start. And then those that are producing beverage drops are even smaller. So it's just like, hasn't really, you know, shown up in the market quite yet. Maybe, you know, with some sales data coming, you know, now that they've introduced this stuff, we'll see that it does well. But it's just an interesting format, I think. You know, maybe if I was in their shoes, the bet I'd make, you know, is maybe on the mocktail side and like the people moving away from alcohol and like wanting to just, you know, put this into drinks that, you know, don't contain any alcohol. Yeah. Um, you see it in, in like traditional CPG sometimes, I mean, with like soda stream and like adding flavors to yep. it. But I don't really see shelves at the grocery that have, you know, a lot of these types of products. So an interesting choice there uh, well, did they mention anything about that like in any of their their earnings do you see anything on the select squeeze stuff i wouldn't say we necessarily see it show up in the margins or necessarily in the top line but i mean that is that is real category innovation and yeah. and category innovation and branding is what will enable you to have higher margins is higher margins in this space over time it's it's hard to brand flower and, and retain you know mm-hmm. high high margins and pricing in, in that category and so you know that's just a that's that's where these companies need to go with innovation because that sort of innovation and, and brand building is what ultimately uh, you know protects protects that business over the long term. Um, it's it's a small category now, but I mean, I think the the value proposition is firm right there. I mean, when you put those drops into a into a drink, I mean, you could you know, I don't know how many how many calories in a vodka soda or something or you know something that somebody would drink a, you know, for for a cocktail, but um, you could have a, a seltzer or something with those drops and it's zero calories and so. You know, it kind of makes right. sense that there's, you know, for, for people that have that, you know, health and wellness bend to it that don't want to, you know, consume cannabis, you know, either by smoking flour or in, in, in an inhalation form and don't want a gummy or whatever, it, it kind of makes sense as a, as a category. And then the nanotechnology is like faster acting. And so theoretically it, you know, hits you at a, at a faster pace and exit, you, exits your, your system at a faster pace. So, I mean, that's, you know, th- those are all like check the box kind of kind of stuff we'll see how the cat we'll see how it does i mean it's like a brand new product but right um everything everything about that kind of makes sense in terms of you know what, what you want to see for for uh for brand development product development. I, th- I think it's incredibly smart too because i think there's a lot of ways because you bring it i've seen people bring it out to bars and bring it to friends homes and the same thing matt they're dropping it in like a seltzer maybe they're a person who doesn't drink that much and they're in the company of people who do and it's their way. But what I've seen then is then they're sharing it. People are trying it. And so like, that's an amazing in-person brand. We all know brand evangelizing like that is, is the stickiest. And so I think that the other thing is they're navigating around kind of the complicated and onerous infrastructure of beverage. Beverage is heavy and distributing it is not easy and distributing it requires certain like it creates wear and tear on tra- I mean there's all these ways that beverage creates challenges that I don't think a lot of people have baked in and I think this is a pretty lightweight and a smart way to navigate around it and they certainly are a category leader in it and I was very impressed when they launched it in 15 markets because that must have been a massive on the backside I can't even imagine in this in, in cannabis especially the lift that was probably pretty immense so I was very impressed by that and I think that product is a smart one. Yeah, I love that idea of category innovation, and I, mm-hmm. I, I do believe beverage will only get bigger. I think beverage is, there's a lot of uh, interest right now in yeah. the category. I think that there's a um, just a lack of, of, of category innovation. There's really mm-hmm. just not that many people producing beverages. If you go into a, a retailer or a cannabis retailer in California and you look for the beverage section, compared to everything else, it is tiny, right? It's in the corner maybe in a fridge, you know, maybe not. And so I think that there's there's a lot of opportunity there, and it's kind mm-hmm. of 
kind of white space. So we'll see how that plays out. But on the other side, another announcement that they made this quarter is their uh, Select Click, which is their proprietary vapor pen system. This, I think, is interesting in a nearer term because the vapor pen category is so large, particularly in markets like California. Also, in, in some of the data we see, you know, we can see customer loyalty and the it's pretty intuitive, uh, but the, the people that purchase proprietary hardware for proprietary pod system generally buy that brand again, right? Because you're invested in it. It's like if you get a Keurig Razor coffee Razor machine, Razor. you're not mm-hmm. going to go and buy Nespresso pods and invest in another Nespresso, you know, a separate machine. Not that it's the same scale, right? A battery is, is much cheaper than that. But this idea that you kind of create some sort of lock-in with the consumer. We saw this, you know, in many markets, but California, one of the markets that they're, you know, introducing this into, uh, they launched in Arizona, California, Nevada, and Oregon, which I thought was pretty interesting. West Coast markets, mature markets, markets where vapor pen category is, is large, and particularly in California, and they're going to be competing primarily, and they already compete with Stizzy right now in the market. And Stizzy far and away dominates. They do 24% of total vapor pen units in the state right now. So Basically, you know, one out of four vapor pen uh, units in in the state is Stizzy. Select is ranked number four for vapor pen, not not including Click. Um, this is, you know, they're just kind of select standard vapor pens. So they're already, you know, up there in the charts, and now they have a competitive product uh, with something like Stizzy. And if they can do what Stizzy did in California, and Stizzy hasn't necessarily had that same level of success in other markets, and I think it's a par- byproduct of the brand licensing strategy that they've used, kind of like Wana versus what Kiraleaf's doing with kind of going into specific markets with their products. I think that it's got a good a good chance. So it'll be interesting to kind of watch that one and see if that starts to grow some of their wholesale business. I did have an opportunity to talk with uh, Patrick Larkin, uh, SVP over there recently, um, and we talked a bit about this. And I think he said that they did a, a million units of selling. It's on a CPG podcast I do, and that interview will come out soon. But uh, it's pretty good, pretty good volume, you know, across all the markets they're in. So thought that was interesting. Again, back to that scale. And the last thing I'll say on this one is kind of an interesting note. They uh, they partnered with Rolling Stone. Did you guys see this, their announcement there for 2022? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's like, uh, what magazine is going to be next? Is it uh, National Geographic? Is it uh, Better Housekeeping? But uh, I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know. I can't think of a, of a you know, Rolling Stone is bigger than a magazine, but it's uh, kind of a media property. Are there any other like media property partnerships that are out there? I was thinking High Times doesn't even really have a branded product, right? I know they're doing some retail for a minute and kind of bounce around between things, but uh, yeah, can you guys think of anything? I'm I cannot. No, yeah, I can't first think of one. Any other one that's like that. Yeah, so we'll see how well, it goes. I mean, they, they, right. they just did that recently, so yeah. right, right, and that's not coming out till 2022. Great. So you know, I guess that's that's a good place to to kind of. Actually, I'm pretty sure I saw that in, in Vegas a few weeks back. They had they had displays set up in one of the. Uh, one of their dispensaries, you know, very very prominent signage and all, all that around the Rolling oh, wow. Stone. Oh, so um, it's so it's in market now. I assume that they launched. I mean, I thought it had launched, but maybe that was just, maybe they just set that like up as something to build thing. up brand maybe awareness like around pre- it. But yeah. yeah, yeah, build demand ahead of time. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. Great. Well, let's move on to uh, next on the list: Green Thumb GTI. <laughs> Emily, you want to kick us off? I mean, no, I'm going to let Matt Matt do it, but I just wanted to say that one of my favorite (laughs) things said on the calls this week was when Ben quoted Anthony Georgiotis saying, dank at scale. (laughs) Like, because we all know how difficult, uh, yeah. Their CFO, right. Anthony Georgiatis is their CFO and he is a very, he's very good at his job. But I think that's like, you know, we're (laughs) growing good cannabis at scale is the hardest one of the hardest parts of this industry. And I just like the dank at scale. It was a good nod. I mean, look, I think these, these green thumb guys, these, this company is, is, is outstanding. In my, in my opinion, they're the best MSO They're They are very good stewards of shareholder capital. They tend to deploy capital ahead of market inflections. They don't chase shiny objects. Their execution is always solid. And that shows up in their operating results. And what, what's, you know, what's remarkable about them is also the consistency that we see in the operating metrics. And in 2020, they were growing their top line at an incredible pace, and they were they were building their their gross margin with very minimal minimal GNA dollar growth for most of the year. They spent just perfectly to align with assets as they came online. So the contribution margin or that incremental profitability through all last year was incredibly high. 
and now as they hit this year, those EBITDA margins have remained steady at around 35%, and they've generated positive operating cash flow for, for going on two years. Now in this quarter, the top line grew by around 5%, Probably half of that was M and A, so not you know again not a heroic growth rate for for organic growth. Now most of that growth was in the retail business. I think that was up seven percent. The wholesale business to like external customers was up around one percent, and that is probably reflective of slow market growth in Pennsylvania and Illinois. Not heroic top line growth rate, but they beat the market. You know if the market was flat, they they did a little bit better than that. And their gross margin rate was flat as can be, which shows that they are very efficient in their production base. It also shows they didn't really, they didn't play that promotion game at all. I mean, there was literally no change in their gross margin rate. So, I mean, there were, there were probably a million things that go into that. It's probably a fluke that it actually was just so flat, but I mean, it's, their consistency there is, is, is notable. Now on the GNA side, they did hire people to support the growth that they had planned into 22. And there's probably some GNA growth from the, from the uh, things that they acquired. Um, so the GNA dollars went up by around $5 million, and that hurt their EBITDA rate by about 100 basis points. But their EBITDA rate was still at 30, 34.7% of sales in the quarter, which is very, very good. And they remain extremely well capitalized for growth. I mean, they had $286 million in cash. Uh, that was down by about $75 million because they spent $70 million on cash capex, and they spent you know, some on, on M&A. Uh, they're probably pulling some of that capex forward from 2022, but I mean overall, I mean it wasn't a wasn't a uh, as high of a top line growth quarter as we've seen in the past. But these you know, they they executed extremely well and they you know remain very profitable. And the slight degradation we saw in margin rate was something that I'm confident they'll lever back into in, into next year. And to be fair, like you know 34.7 versus 30. 5.6 or whatever it was before is like just totally fine. That's a normal variation in range, but I mean, they they just continue to to execute extremely well. You know, the, as, I'd say the, the positive things in the, in the next year is these, these building block building blocks for growth are being set up right now for 22 and 23. They have done more M and A uh, this year than they've done in the past. They you know are you know continue to develop assets that have provided them new market entry as well as additional scale in states. So they, you know, made acquisitions and they've done expansion projects in Massachusetts uh, that will bring them to the cap of the retail units that they can have on that, in that state. And then at some point they'll probably uh, expand the grow facilities to get to the cap or they may expand them at some point. But in Rhode Island, they, uh, you know, that was a acquisition into, into a new state uh, with a established and high performing asset. Virginia was a very nascent uh, asset that they bought, but that gives them entry into a new market there, and that will probably provide them substantial growth in 23 is that uh, market converts to adult use. And then they have you know, these big capital projects underway in New York and New Jersey and Ohio that, that you know, set up very well for, for, for 22 and 23. Now, the negatives for them, I would say, is that they probably are not going to have a whole ton of growth into the fourth quarter and the first quarter. That likely probably gets moving again for when, when New Jersey opens up you know, at some point in, in the first half. And there's not really a whole lot of unit growth that I think they'll have in 22. They'll, they'll add some more stores in Florida and they'll probably add some in Virginia and they'll probably get you know, a few more, in, uh, one more in Massachusetts, but they're kind of hitting, hitting up on their caps. But I mean, overall, this thing is you know, just a very solid, solid company, solid performer. And the, the growth rates probably you know, don't look so awesome for the next quarter or two, but that doesn't worry me at all about what, what we're going to see out of them in 22 overall, or especially into, into 23. I think that's right. And I think other things of note are, you know, the ways that they continue to capitalize the business, they always do it with a consideration of shareholder value. So you don't see dilutive financings going on in this company. And I can say as a long shareholder, I've always really appreciated that. I think that what you see here, just from knowing this team, so I have, you know, I've known this team for multiple years now. And the way I, we first invested in GTI is because we knew how Anthony, the CFO, approached his point of view on other companies that we were co-invested in in cannabis. And so the prudence around and discipline around growing the company, but also keeping a, a really close eye on how that impacts your gross margins. And I know you, I think it was you, or someone asked a question about GNA and, and, you know, Anthony's like, yeah, look, we're going to have to, I think he said it in the last call, like, we're going to have to build a bigger boat because they're hiring a lot of people and they're going to, and so it is going to kind of like, it'll be, you got to hire some people and then you get these things open and it's just going to happen that way. But I'm glad you have referenced 
I think we should all be prepared to see flat to, you know, no growth over the next quarter or two, especially with these operators who have exposure in the markets that like on the Northeast that, but when they come online, then we're going to see the next big jump. But um, it will be good to watch how these companies operate through the next two quarters. And I also think based on some of the data we've seen right size that it's like you open these markets and you have mass adoption. People are coming into the stores. They're doing the big buys. It's the Pareto principle. And then you start to see the deepening of the market and more people coming in of different segments who may not be the big ticket buyers, but the more we can get into these markets and get into new consumer segments, the longer lasting the growth of this business will be in the, in the big picture. So. Yeah, and some of them, like uh, Virginia, I thought was an interesting call out because of mm-hmm. that, that Dharma acquisition. And think about Virginia and also kind of based on some things we discussed last week. Last week was you know, coming off of the election cycle, and it was a pretty big hit for the, the Democrats. And, um, you know, Virginia was, was part of that. And there was an article that was published by Marijuana Moment, written by Ned Oliver of the Virginia Mercury, where he mentioned or was mentioned that the newly empowered Republicans of Virginia say plans to allow retail sales of recreational marijuana won't necessarily be doomed under their control. And that's, you know, kind of one of the thoughts, right? Is it going to, are they going to slow things down? Virginia already, I believe, was pretty delayed. I think it was going to be a 2024 market and not getting there, but uh, a delegate, Republican delegate, uh, Glenn Davis, was quoted saying they're open to speeding up the timeline sooner than 2024. Quote, uh, we're half pregnant. (laughs) So it's a funny (laughs) quote. Uh, Uh, (laughs) He's he's worried. (laughs) But they're worried that it, if they don't get in front of it, it's all going to be black market. And unsurprisingly, you know, one of the things that they also called out is that they're not interested in the social equity component. And uh, if you look up that article, we'll link it in the show notes. Uh, he has a quote. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but it's around, you know, they, they think social equity is rewarding like criminals, which obviously, you know, mm. I disagree with. But I think that the the other side in Virginia is now focused more on on less on like licensing for social equity, but you know getting these people out of jail, and that's something that I think uh, I, I saw Ben, uh, yes. CEO of GTI, call out in interviews. You know, just kind of the how ridiculous it's like a joke. You know, this is America. Get these people out of jail. So I think that you know it's maybe a good sign for Virginia. Maybe we will see you know accelerated timeline for adult use, and I think that will help with all these things. Obviously, we would see that probably in 2022, but, uh, you know, maybe 2023. Uh, so, you know, kind of getting in there early, I think makes, makes sense. Okay. Uh, should we move on to Cresco? We right, shall. Sure. Let's do it. So Cresco reported revenue of 215 and a half million, an increase of 2.6% quarter over quarter, 40.6% year over year. Matt, uh, what kind of insights do you have for us here? Yeah, so I think compared to what was expected, their top line was a little bit weaker than was assumed, but they had you know really significant improvement in EBITDA margin and dollars driven by efficiency improvements in manufacturing and the in reduction in corporate expense. Their, their top line grew only around, it was around the same as the other guys on an organic base, or rather it was around 2%, 2.6% quarter over quarter. Uh, we estimate that M&A probably drove about 7 million of that growth. So the organic revenue declined by around 1% in the third quarter on probably on weakness in California and, and Pennsylvania. So not great top line, but the, as I said before, the, the margin rates improved significantly. Their adjusted uh, gross margin rate improved by 320 basis points. Their core GNA on a dollar basis, I think dropped slightly and improved around 90 basis points on a, on a rate basis. So that took their overall EBITDA rate up from by about 450 basis points to t- over 26% in the quarter. And that's you know probably the most notable thing about the quarter for, for them. They had a, a 12.8% EBITDA margin in 2022, which is really, really low compared to peers. And they, you know, they'd say, well, we're building brands and we're growing in California and we're focused on CPG and the margins will come. But in any way you cut it, like their margins last year were not top tier. And that California business they bought in 2020 for like a half a billion dollars, they they wrote it off. So that's that's good. Well, it's a non-cash charge, but you know it shows you they spent way too much money on that business. But you know by refocusing on these other markets and a lot of the M and A has not been bad M and A like they they did in California. It's been you know I would say more fruitful M and A in places like Florida and Massachusetts and you know these areas where they can you know generate a, a strong re- return that is now really beginning to show up on the margins and and they are you know decidedly on the right path here with getting those those margins up 
so they, I think they're in relatively you know good shape there. Now into the fourth quarter, their guidance was that they would do between nine and fourteen percent growth. They maintain that. Um, now they they dropped the guidance. They thought they were going to do two hundred fifty million in revenue in the fourth quarter, and they they dropped that down to. 235 to 245 when they restructure that California business back in in, in October. Now, two thirds of that growth will probably come from M and A. Um, probably half of that's from uh, Massachusetts, and they'll probably get a little bit from Pennsylvania and Maryland. But you know they'll get growth from facilities that they have in in Michigan, Ohio, and you know EBITDA rates are expected to continue to improve, and they think they'll be over a 30 percent by the fourth quarter. I mean they have been like I said a laggard in terms of their peers and uh, with with their margin rates and you know, by the time we start hitting the, the fourth quarter and then to, you know, 22, I don't, I don't think that's going to be a, as much of a concern or even a, a valid critique because they're, they will have, they will have rectified, uh, you know, a lot of that. So, yeah, I think there, I think uh, there's a lot of improvement there with, with Cresco and we, you know, we didn't see awesome top line in the quarter, but the you know, margin rates are, are notable. And with that, their, you know, cash flow will likely improve and they're, they're on much better footing than I think that they were a year ago. I would just, I would mainly echo everything you just said. I just, I feel like the last two quarters they've been spending time to, to kind of, yeah, right the ship a little bit more. And I think they're poised to capitalize on that, on the go forward. I I was, I mean, considering where they are, I was a little surprised by their growth rate for Q4 compared to the rest of the guys, but, um, or the sector, but we'll see. Yeah, it's mostly M and A. So yeah, it's all, yeah. <laughs> so, Even so, yeah. I think you know it's it's unfortunate. I mean, I'm based in California, kind of starting to wonder why. Although today is beautiful, but it's just um, this market continues to just burn people in many many ways. And um, they've got some interesting things going on here. But yeah, I agree with you on the write down of that acquisition. That was an unfortunate early move for them here. Yep, and by. Kind of restructuring that that'll improve their margins significantly. That that was probably a that'll probably be about a point of margin benefit into the into the mm-hmm. fourth quarter. And um, you know they're 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 still very Illinois and Pennsylvania centric. And you know Illinois will still be their 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 best asset, but they're they're gaining scale with their asset base in Pennsylvania. They'll be at the caps in Massachusetts, and that, that'll be a big business for for Cresco in the next year. And then they'll get you know some growth from Florida. So yeah, yeah. Like I said a few times, things are kind of coming together there. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll watch for those uh, those margins, and then they also called out record net wholesale revenue, 109 million, and then record re- uh, record retail revenue, 106 million. So it sounds like they're kind of on that 50-50. Kind of some of our uh, comments about CureLeaf. So it'll be interesting. You, you mentioned Matt, like the, you know, they're saying the brand building and and doing all of that, and maybe that's where you know some of that split comes from. I love when companies put record growth in their in their titles of their uh, releases, like "oh, record growth." I mean, they, every quarter should be record growth at this stage of the industry. Like, if they're not record growth every quarter, something really bad happened. So that's another thing we'll watch for. Yeah, see, see if they <laughs> use the word "record growth." Yeah. Next not quarter. record growth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess just omitting it kind of is the same thing as writing that. But yeah. I, I can't imagine they'd want to write that. Okay, let's let's move on to ascend. So Ascend net revenue increased 13.2% quarter over quarter. So is this some of the highest sequential uh, we've seen to 94.4 million? And I know that it's a bit smaller on the revenue side versus some of the other companies we're talking about, but that's some good sequential growth. Yeah, a good good percentage of growth. I mean, they had full quarter benefit from three dispensaries that opened in the second quarter, and they're from a, they have a much smaller base, so the the gro- the percentage growth rate should be higher than sure. than 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 uh, some of the other MSOs, but they they did have a good increase in transaction count. They had longer store hours in, in their Chicago dispensaries, and their net wholesale revenue grew around twenty two percent to um, I think around a third of sales in the quarter. You know, more of their production is going towards wholesale than to their own stores, which has a margin implication. So their their gross margins drop by around 120 basis points to 46%, but their GNA dollars drop modestly on, you know, some things that they're doing with shared resources. And, you know, they, they levered their sales growth, you know, to improve that by around 560 basis points. And their EBITDA growth was up around 16% year over year, which was about a 60 basis point improvement in rate. They were right around 25%. So all in, that was fairly good. I mean, their, their, their cash from ops was slightly negative, but that should probably be flattish or positive in, in, into next quarter. And 
um, you know, they raised 133 million in net debt in the third quarter and you know, have over $200 million in cash and they have plenty to pay for that MedMen transfer that, that asset and they, they can, you know, fund CapEx at a similar or higher rate into next year. And the outlook, I think, is still reasonably good. The 3Q came in a little better than expected in terms of the top line. The thing that they noted was there was weakness in, in retail across the board. They, they said they were seeing, you know, declines and this, that, that's a you know like I said that's a theme into the, probably the fourth quarter as well that the the consumer is not as healthy as it had been in, in the third quarter and the second quarter so that is going to be a headwind for them and they're noting less volume or less wholesale volume growth as well which will likely reduce their revenue so they lowered their full year guide from uh, to the low end of that 330 to 350 which at the at the bottom end of that would imply mm-hmm. that they could be down around eight or nine percent in terms of revenue um, sequentially which, you know, isn't great, but I mean, so if they went to the, I don't think they'll get to the whole bottom of that range, but you know, they, they, they guided it down. And then that impact as well with the overall, you know, market slowdowns compounded by, you know, regulatory delays and construction delays on cultivation projects, which is, you know, par for the course across this industry, uh, bar none. Uh, But, you know, their, their facilities in Illinois will not, you know, come online in the, at the pace that they thought it would and Massachusetts will not, be online at the at the at the timing they had thought it would, and you know the the challenge with that is, and I, and mentioned this, you know when when we started, when you're in a high growth industry and you're investing this capital and your GNA investment is required to fund growth, and you don't have that growth, your costs are not aligned with uh with the uh, with the revenue, or rather your, your costs are increasing, but if the revenue doesn't come through, then you're going to have a negative margin impact, and so their margins will probably be down by. A, you know, maybe 100 or 200 basis points in the in the first quarter or in the fourth quarter and in, in in the first quarter, so you know that isn't particularly good. But you know, they're, they're, the other thing they noted was that trans- transaction counts were strong, but basket size is decreasing, so the frequency is good, but people are spending less when they go through, which makes total sense if we're in a you know inflationary environment and people just have less dollars to spend because they're spending more on gas and they're spending more on food and they're spending more on everything. That you know it would would likely hurt the basket size, and yeah, you know, that that's you know broadly and probably going to be an issue for the industry. But unit growth will probably slow a little bit into into twenty two for them, but you know that that will lower the outlook modestly. But overall, I, I think overall the setup for them is pretty good into next year. Um, the other thing to note there is that MedMen license transfer there. Uh, it's in the hands of the regulators to get that transferred. It's you know kind of seven weeks out. It has to happen before year end. It's kind of down to the wire, but you know that should transfer. But if it doesn't, then they they may not have the the New York asset. But that's you know one one other thing to note about the quarter. Yeah, I think that what you're seeing here with Ascend is it's a younger MSO relative to the peer group, right? So it it started in May 2018, and uh, we IPO'd in May on May 4th of this year. So it was a it's been an active few years, and I think that the management team is, you know, really trying to get their arms around <laughs> what it's like, you know, as as the other MSO operators can tell you, there's the things you can control in your business. And then there's like things like the regulations and then like some of these other slowdowns that, you know, they're facing on, on some of the builds. And I think they're going to get better at understanding the timelines for these things. But I think that it's just one of those things that I'm, I'm watching in real time as they refine the way that they are, are planning around this. So I think that's just one thing. I also think that they're, you know, they're, they're not in as many markets as uh, GTI. I'm all of a sudden, like, is GTI 16 or 16 markets, right? Not sure. Uh, 14, I think. 14? It's yeah. probably 14. But they're in, they're in fewer a, by markets. By the way, that's such a weird statistic because that's like, you know, whether you're in like, I'd rather you be in two right. really awesome markets that are very profitable than 10 that like completely stink. So kind of a vanity sort of like, metric that unless you yeah. like drill a little deeper, what does it mean? Yeah, I it's agree. Like saying, in that... like, you're five foot ten. Like is five foot ten. <laughs> you know, there's a lot. There's a lot that there's, that sort of tells you something about the person, but it really is. <laughs> you know, doesn't really tell you much else. I, I agree with you, by the way. I'd rather, and that's been, you know, Abner's mantra since <laughs> since he started this thing is uh, go deep, not wide. And he really has been focused on asset selection and trying to figure out, you know, the depth on that. But I think that where, where I was going with that is that, you know, on regulatory delays, when you're not in a lot of markets, you really feel it, right? So, because it, it's like, you just don't have that broad base, even if 
it's not the best across a broad base, which we've seen how that can detract from some of the operators. But anyway, I do think, you know, we talk about this a lot. It's, it's stair-step growth. It was never going to be linear. And I think that they're just refining their process as a, as a younger company across the board, learning, you know, about what it's like, especially learning what it's like to be public as an operator in this space. So. Yeah, yeah. And to to kind of jump on the the basket conversation, you know, in markets like Massachusetts, I mean, it was pretty retail constrained. There weren't enough stores early on. I think we saw a a lot open this year. And in most markets, when that happens, you know, you see like just larger transaction sizes. And, you know, some of that, you know, coming down is certainly just price pressure too, just pricing as the as the market matures. So, you know, products are maybe a little less expensive. So baskets are, are, not as large, and then you you combine that with all the, you know, your point, Matt, and just the pandemic and inflation and challenges and share of wallet, you know, all kind of combines. And the data I looked at at Massachusetts in particular, uh, January 2021 baskets. This is pre-tax, post-discount. Average basket was eighty-one dollars and forty-one cents, uh, and November it's seventy-three dollars and fifty-five cents. So it's a decrease of about ten percent. Um, and, and then just to kind of give you a sense of like basket counts in Massachusetts, uh, in January 2021, we saw about a million uh, baskets, a million transactions happen. Uh, and then in Q3, uh, average is about 1.6 million. And it's pretty flat. It's, uh, it was about 1.6 and 1.64 and 1.61. Uh, I think in, in November, or sorry, October, it's, uh, it's was 1.63. So kind of steady right there. And I think, um, you know, a couple things could change that you know, significantly the delivery question. And that was something that uh, I think was mentioned on the earnings call by Abner is they're opening up delivery in in Massachusetts. I think delivery is is pretty interesting. You know, we see a lot of delivery in markets like California, but I don't think, you know, there's really not much in the way of delivery outside of in in any meaningful, you know, scale. And um, it's new in Massachusetts. You know, I, I don't really know the structure. I know that delivery, when they launched in Massachusetts, or the structure around it, had to do with social equity and giving those licenses to, to underserved communities. And I think there's a few different models. One of which is is the courier model. So I think it's I, I I would guess that that's what Ascend is leveraging because if you're vertically integrated, producing your own you know products, selling your own products, you can't be a delivery as well unless you're a micro license, unless you're you know pretty small, which obviously Ascend is not. But that'll be interesting to see, you know, does this drive more baskets? Because it it does, you know, delivery opens up quite a a broad audience, right? Because now you can reach a lot of consumers that might not, you know, want to drive in. Plus just purchase habits of people these days. Like I think a lot of people are used to getting things delivered from food to groceries and and beyond, right? So maybe we'll see some more more growth in in the basket counts there to maybe offset some of this decrease in, in basket that we're talking about. Cool. All right. I think the last one, Columbia Care, they reported today, I believe. I actually haven't had a chance to look. Matt, have you had a chance? Oh, I sure did. Oh, Matt did. (laughs) (laughs) Matt, are you okay on time? We were running a little long. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, after after this, I just need to go to sleep because I've been nothing but earnings this whole week and it's been a very long (laughs) week running on on, uh, caffeine and hope. Fuel, I don't know what I'm fueled by right now, but it's not <laughs> a passion for the capital markets, I guess, is what, what's fueling me right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, so Columbia Care reported this morning, I mean, their, their revenue growth rate was about 10 points lower, their percentage growth rate was around 10 points lower than expected. They had, you know, they had price pressure in markets like California and Pennsylvania and Florida, as others had noted. Um, they had delays in regulatory approvals and broader macro headwinds, but I mean, their their focus on margin improvement in 21 was very, 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 very visible in their third quarter results. Their EBITDA rate improved by 850 basis points. They're now at like 23%. And that was driven a lot by growth in the wholesale business and, and building scale through that overall system that resulted in you know EBITDA just about doubling from the second quarter to the third quarter. They were around 31 million in EBITDA, which was you know they had a they actually had a top line miss, but they actually made they they did miss on the on the EBITDA line because they had such strong margin improvement it was better than than expected. Now the top line was weak, so they dropped their full year guidance for revenue, gross margin, and EBITDA dollars. And you know we expect to see again with similar trend here. We expect to see slower growth for across the board through probably the first quarter. That will probably limit the upside that they would see on you know margin rate and margin dollars. 
and the the fourth quarter guide was based on the, the change in the full year guide their their fourth quarter uh, expectations are, are lower than than had been assumed I think consensus was about 160 million for them in the fourth quarter they got it implied uh, 135 to 150 kind of a wide range for this far in the in the in the year but we're you know whatever but uh, and then their, their EBITDA they also got it down as well the consensus was at 40 million and and they, they got it to be uh, 27 to 37 means that their EBITDA could actually be down slightly into the fourth quarter uh, to up by 20% in the fourth quarter uh, based on that uh, that range that they that they provided. But, you know, overall, like they're going to have around 20 retail additions across five states into through like, through 22. Um, now, some of those will probably be pretty low volume units in places like West Virginia. But, you know, the Virginia sets up for 23, which they'll be adding units in Virginia. They'll have new units in New York. They'll put some up in New Jersey, some in Maryland. So they should have, you know, reasonably good retail revenue growth in 22. But the more material driver over the long term for them is going to be they're they're adding 850,000 square feet or so of cultivation capacity across 10 states that will make them significantly more vertically integrated and will their their wholesale business is very very small compared to um, other operators. You know, I think uh, last year they were like 8% or something and they they finished this quarter Partly helped by the G Leaf acquisition, but they they were twenty percent uh, wholesale, and you know it's it's hard to I'm not sure it's really even that it's hard, it's hard to predict what that will become because there's you know there's a lot there's a, there's a lot that will that, that goes into that, that, but their wholesale business will likely go up a lot in twenty two. I think it, it'll probably be north of thirty five percent of the business in twenty two, and you know being more vertically integrated and you know having a, a bigger wholesale business should drive continue to drive margin rates up for them. So they're they're still a little bit below peers, but but they have you know, really made a, a substantial amount of progress on on getting the uh, margin dollars and profit rates up this year. And, you know, I don't think I don't think we're gonna see much improvement there in the fourth quarter or first quarter, but over 22, I think we'll, you know, continue to see good improvement. Fantastic. Yeah, all sounds good. Well, cool, Matt. Uh, what a week, huh? It's quite a bit. <laughs> what a week. Oh. Yeah. What and, a week. Uh, what, uh, I guess only a handful more uh, next week and maybe a, a, a straggler or two the following week. You know, I guess next week we see True Leave and Verano. And actually uh, on the high rise, uh, we're excited that Kim Rivers will be joining us. So we'll really get to kind of dig into some of, um, you know, what they're talking about. So kind of excited for that. Matt, I can't thank you enough. Uh, your, your wealth of knowledge is just so valuable, and I'm sure all the listeners just will love all this insight. It's just fantastic, and we'd love to do it again if you'd be open to uh, following up in a future future quarter here. Sure. Happy to join. Yeah. So, now go get some sleep, and don't dream right. about EBITDA or <laughs> gross margins. Dream about cannabis growth in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.